have this little mushroom. Nice. See that thing? Mm-hmm. Really cute. I like that mushroom. Yeah, too. it's cute. And it does, it's... All right, so welcome, Mary Jane Rubenstein, to the Institute for Advanced Astonishment. Thank you. Thank you. I am astonished in an advanced way about that mushroom trick already. You are a dream guest, and I'm so happy you're here. Um, been a big fan of all your work from, if I may mention, um, obviously your new book. Uh, uh, this is all coming out of my head, so and there's so much going on here. Astrotope, po- Astrotopia, I'm saying it wrong. I know, that's it, uh, you got it. Yeah, and but Strange Wonder. No kidding. And, and um, Pantheologies and the Multiverse books and Entangled Worlds that I think you edited and played. But my favorite things that I don't think you get every day is your your articles like uh, the title I love so much was the rebirth of the death of God. Like we share a wordplay thing that Shakespeare would understand and Douglas Hofstetter would understand this wordplay. And my favorite unknow thyself. That apophatic article. If we could focus a little on that today. And my Uh, stack art, yeah. Yeah, wherever you want to go, I'm happy to go. So the main thing I'll just tell you is um, on astonishment, there's a little three about like the M to the third on the astonishment. And the third, it's so we focus on to keep me on track because you know how conversations can go. Uh, To keep me on track, um, three M's in astonishment. And today we will do one that, Usually we bypass, we don't, the first one is matter. And that's your, so this is going to be the matter episode of the Institute for Advanced Astonishment. The second M is the medicine, medicines that might allow us to, or it could be meditation that allow, or yoga that allows us to see maybe the nature of matter or see a little deeper into it. And the third M is more of a mind training where you, like yoga, and I know you do, um, and we can get into that later at the end, uh, like a a bettering of the set, like a, 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 a dissipating of the ego, a dissolving of the ego, and a training the mind to stay on what really matters and not the past and the future and the anxiety. And, and I know you work on that with yoga and and I love what you said about give everybody, uh, I don't know if you still feel that way, but if we gave everybody uh, a monthly income, if we gave a, then they could, especially in Guatemala, uh, they're focused so much on just eating air and food and they can't think about metaphysics and philosophy. And But if you let them have a chance, they can focus on that. And instead of working 12 hours, you know, and I love when you said that. Thank so you. those are the three, but matter. All right. So what is matter? What is, we could talk about, I'll give you three things. The difference between pantheism and panentheism. Uh, what is matter? What is God? That might do about an hour. Okay. Should we go for it? Sure. All right. Thank um, you. Of course. Well, first of all, it's really lovely to be here and to anybody who happens to be uh, listening in, greetings to you. And I hope you're happy, well, and peaceful. Um, Let's start, I mean, let's start with a pantheism, panentheism question, um, because uh, that will fold all of the other ones in. Um, Pantheism, just to start out, is um, it's the idea that the universe itself, everything that is both materially and uh you know ideally so both matter and mind like everything that is the universe the whole universe um that that is what we call god that 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 god and the universe are the same thing Um, we can get rid of the god i love that you call the dude in the sky or or this podcast is totally not for i can never buy that that. yeah that's gone that's Sky, you know, the dude in the sky is a metaphor and has always been a metaphor. Yeah. And, you know, even um, Orthodox Christians will admit that's a metaphor, that he he is 
best image that theologians thought they could come up with to describe somebody you came from, right? Like yes. I, father, right? Somebody you came from, somebody you are responsible to, somebody who sets the rules, somebody um, who, you know, orders everything in your life and ultimately judges you that like, but it's still a metaphor. Right. Um, and the problem, one of the big problems with Christian theology in particular is that it forgets that it's dealing with a metaphor. Um, yes. And it thinks that there is actually somehow a dude in the sky and right. throwing lightning bolts and exactly. angry. You know, yeah. yeah. And then we have, and then we have a whole bunch of problems that we can, <laughs> we can talk about. Um, so, you know, so the idea that the idea behind pantheism is to ask what it is that these metaphors for God, for divinity are trying to say. Um, and one of the things they're trying to say is that that word that we use, when we use the word God, we are talking about the origin of all things, right? The, the place everything comes from the end of all things, the place everybody go, everything goes. And then the medium in which all things are, that that's, that is, that's yes. it. Right? Um, and that for a pantheist, um, it makes much more sense to call that the universe, right? I come from the universe. Yes. I will dissolve back into the universe and it's the universe that sustains me. In the genderless, universe. genderless. And yeah, so it doesn't it's very say, good. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't set one sex up over another. It doesn't set one species up against another. Um, if you're if you're a pantheist, you could just as easily see divinity in a duck or a mustard seed yes. as a human. Right? Um, so uh, so that's that's the idea behind behind pantheism. Um, it's an idea, as you know, certainly, Jim, that um, you know professional philosophers and theologians have made a lot of fun of for a really long time, um, and. It's been my experience. I, I was a little worried about writing about it because I thought I was going to get mixed up. Um, yeah. It turns out that when you talk to just like folks about it, like ordinary people, like people, you know, people in my family, people I would meet at conferences, in bookstores, in churches and synagogues and um, think bookstores, things like that. Um, they'd be like, yeah, I think I'm a pantheist. I, like no, no ordinary person has a problem with this. Only like professional philosophers and theologians have a problem with pantheism. Right. Um, Your people, colleagues. My colleagues, <laughs> yeah. um, who are really coming around, I have to say, they've been totally So lovely. it took so much courage for you to do that, because, I mean, in your book, was it, I can't remember the guy's name, would a P? Pat, help me. Um, the main guy that just railed against him in the oh, worst Pierre way. Bale? Pierre that, Bale? Guy. Yeah, that guy. Oh, my God. Like, and yeah. even Hegel said, like, you're wanting in thought if you, like, all these it's just mocked and criticized. Well, it's criticized for being infantile, for being um, womanly, for being right. Um, I mean, the, like the womanly thing, is infantile. Like womanly is right, exactly. And you're right. So I think for me, I was like, well, I don't know. I've been an infant, and I'm kind of ah. a girl, so it'll be all right. I can I can stand behind. This like thing. Jesus said, only through the eyes of a child will you enter the <laughs> kingdom of heaven. Yeah. yeah, it's all that thinking mind, and the academics just trashed it. Um, so, so panentheism is this, like, I mean, I think of it as a hedge. It's like a philosophical hedge. Um, it's a compromise that philosophers and theologians came up with in order to affirm that, yes, of course, God is in all things and all things are in God. But like, that doesn't mean that God and the universe are the same thing. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a sort of both and position. Oh, it's kind of like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they still, a panentheist will still affirm the distinction between God and the world. God is not the world, but God is in the world and the world is in God. Here's the thing. Philosophically speaking, I think I, I and I will, my, some of my best friends are panentheists. I really mean <laughs> it. Um, I philosophically think it, speaking, I don't think it holds up, um, but it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, no. it really matters. What matters, I think, is a way of, and I'm going to let God take care of God's self right now. Like, I don't really care how we interact with God. I, God can take care of that God's self, right? Um, what matters I, to me, at least, is um, a kind of comportment um, of uh, relating to the beings around us and the world that we make up um, in a reverent and gracious, um, grateful and um, caring way. And that- I um, I think that can be, I, I think if you're, if you're looking to do that, um, 
then pantheism is an interesting thing to think about. It's interesting to think about the possibility that like the world might itself be divine. That like when you see yes. a, a mushroom, right? You see mushrooms growing, yes. and you're like, oh, wow, like the things that can be created out of nothing. It's that's <laughs> incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Um, but you know what? That same comportment can come from panentheism. Like it just because you affirm that the the distinction of God and world doesn't mean suddenly that you're, you know, an ethically bereft human being. And in fact, that same comportment can come out of Orthodox Jewish Christian Islamic theology as well. Um, you know, for some of my nun friends about an hour west, yeah. um, they would, you know, they would never agree to the <laughs> idea that somehow, you know, God shows up as a tomato plant, right? But they would absolutely affirm the idea that the tomato plant shows forth the beauty and the goodness of God. Yes. Yes. Um, and so for that reason, it is it's it's uh, our obligation to um, be good stewards of the land God has created. So you know ultimately, I, I think i'm um I'm after a again, I'm after like a comportment and a um a way of seeing the world i think pantheism helps dislodge some of our um some of the assumptions we have about how like matter is dead or the earth doesn't isn't isn't alive or something like that um but i don't think you have to be a pantheist to be a good steward of this earth at all no, um, no. I don't, right it helps a little bit it helps it helps a lot of atheists uh, as an eight as you know uh, I, I was a big skeptic my whole life and mm -hmm. Pantheism made sense to me. I can get to that cosmic dust or co the cosmos and the, the Carl Sagan universe and the Neil deGrasse Tyson universe, but I couldn't get to that behind that was something divine. I didn't, but it, but still, as I, I think I mentioned to you, my mentor was the amazing Randy, James Randy. Uh, he was such a kind man and such a good man. And Carl Sagan and Isaac Asimov, and these were the people that came through the house, and they were there, and he loved everyone. So he, it, an atheist isn't a dirty word, or you know, they can, the the biggest hearts could be atheists. They just don't buy that dude in the sky. <laughs> so. Well, they don't buy the dude in the sky, and also often when when they come up against the idea of pantheism, that like all those things that they are so amazed by and in love with, um, that we can call that God. They're like, yeah, but why? Why call it God? Why not yes. just call it the call and nature? Yeah, yeah. And I'm totally sympathetic to that position. Um, my sense is not that if you begin with a reverence of the natural world, you then have to call it God. My sense is if you're going to be talking about God, you should be talking about the natural world, right? That's um, amazing. The don't have to yeah. be talking about God. They just, they're like, why would I stick a God hat on it? And if that's yeah. where you're coming from, don't stick a God hat. <laughs> like, what's I have nothing to, right? I have nothing to lose um, here. Yeah. And it, like, as you would say, yeah, like, bring God to me, what I get from you as a mystic is you bring God home to now, not later, not, you know, my watch <laughs> is now. And it's, you bring God, um, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, closer you bring god immediate like it's now not you have to cross over to sure there and maybe that's the panentheism that yes it's even bigger than what once we physically die there's something even bigger and grander but and that's true <laughs> but now right now you're bringing god immediately to the tomato plant to you know the breath and this is, again, this is, you can find that kind of imminence of divinity in like a total heresy like pantheism yeah. that all deserve to be burned at the stake for. Um, right. All my favorite it, people. <laughs> you can find it in the Gospel of Matthew where yes. it's like, if you aren't feeding these poor people, you're not feeding me. Like God yes. is poor people, right? Um, so it's, it's again, you don't, you don't have I to- say May I yeah. say here in a I'm in a restaurant sometimes called Tersa Ojo, which is the third eye. And it's just so perfectly set up to talk to others. It's like a beautiful, I can't explain. The space is set up where you just turn to the next who's next to you and everyone just talks. Okay. And we're all talking about changing the world and love is everything. And then in walks a beggar. 
and I watch everyone turn away. Everyone. And I'm reaching in for the money or the take care of their food, but they turn away. So it's so weird, like exactly what you said, that it's right here immediately. Yeah, no, like that was God. That was God right there. Giving you a chance to give. Yeah. <laughs> give to the poor. Give It's me. Right. Yeah. It's not for you. It's it's a mm-hmm. transaction with the beloved or the divine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, maybe not. I don't know. Absolutely, I, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely. Learning. Right I'm right there. With you. I, you know, I, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I don't it's, it's at that point that you start making calculus about like what's this person going to do with the money or what's yes, the and they all do that. They all. I ask her her name, and her name's Maria here, and she comes in, Mary Jane, like. And I know it sounds weird, but I know you'll understand. Like it's om- she comes in with this Mayan clothing on, and it's almost as if she's floating in. She has such grace. And I don't think they see that, but I I see it. She it's almost like she's floating in and she comes in with nothing. And I know she might drink with the money, she might, but you could always offer her a smoothie or something, and she takes it. You can do whatever, yeah. And I watch them all just turn away or clap when she leaves. Really? Yes. I shouldn't put that on the podcast, but I'm saying it's true. And I and I'm so new here. I'm only here six, seven months, but I feel and I ask them like in a dream, in a dream, if if we were dreaming, you and I, if you were dreaming, and in walks this lady who might look a little bit dirty, but she's elegant in a way that is beyond words. And she comes to you and puts her hand out in a dream, in your dream, it would be you coming to you. It's it's yourself coming to yourself, just like you said about God. And maybe there's a better way than I can imagine where you just smile at her and look at her and don't give her. But I don't I don't know yet. I don't know how to I still give or at least acknowledge her or love, show her love or you know in a dream it's you. In a dream it's you. In a dream it's you. I think it's I know we're not talking so much about mine today, but when you were when you were talking at the beginning about um accessing mental states that allow you know your mind to recognize itself as part of a more um interconnected maybe yes. not but interconnected many-minded mind um i like yes. this, this idea that your your dream you could see dreams as just being narcissistic right everybody in there is you yes. everybody, um, right. or you could see dreams as allowing you to access that kind of state in which all of these people plants animals could be you or, or not not again the one a, real you yeah the, the yeah but that you're, you, you participate in something that inheres in all of it right um you participate in something that shows forth in all of it and the beautiful stuff and stuff and uh, um and this is why i like the i you know this idea of pantheism not because it like wraps us all up into one big ball and says we're all the same because we're not all the same we have a lot of differences um but there's there's something that shows up um as yes. like the light in things um and that's the thing that i think you're saying we need to at least to acknowledge and see and respect i've also had this this um experience of being approached by somebody on the street and just you know you know sometimes we just don't carry cash anymore and like yes. if there's no cash it's open if you're not on that kind of street or if you're driving by someone and you don't have a cliff bar on your hand or whatever right um, of you know just looking at the person in the eye and saying yes I'm sorry Hugging them or just looking just the look you're so right um, yeah, and often they'll be like well thanks have a nice day but at least you know at yes. least you don't feel like the world isn't doesn't My teacher it. once, when when the same lady came in, he was here. Now he's gone, but he was here. And when he was here, I watched him. He was the one that got me away from the Randy view into the more expansive, spacious view. And uh, I watched him with her. And sometimes he gave money. Same lady. 
But sometimes she would come to him and I'm right next to him. And it's called a Kasali here. I don't, you know, like a Kas uh, uh, Kasali coin. And she would say one Kasali and she's right there. So elegant and beautiful. And he would say back, and I watched this man, no Kasali, but he said it on a frequency that was so beautiful, like an opera, like a aria. And then she sang back whatever she said in Spanish that I didn't understand. And he came back and they started almost singing together, but he was saying no Kasali and she would say no Kasali. And it was so beautiful. And it's what you said, like at least a look he acknowledged her and he's now he's singing with her. Right. And maybe I can't, can't give you money or maybe I can't give you, but I can give you human interaction. And he and did. I yeah. It was right there. And I would always reach in and give that one like an idiot. <laughs> I would give it. And maybe later we saw her drunk on the road on the ground, but maybe she needed that to get through the, horrific life she's going through you know? yeah if i if i were in a position of having to ask people to enter public spaces and ask people for money i might also just want to get drunk to forget yeah. that I, yes and to... drunk on like baudelaire you know that poem uh will always be drunk drunk on poetry or art or virtue or wine but be oh. drunk because <laughs> time is going to crush you time will crush you unless you stay in yeah. that you know all right, so we solve pantheon and then panentheism is so you're not what would you consider yourself? Uh, in the middle or are you more of a pantheist? Well you don't have to say. <laughs> I I usually shy away from this question. Let me tell you the way that I usually answer this question. Um <laughs> I never I, heard you answer this. I I usually answer this question by saying um, that I was raised a number of different things. This is true. That's I was good. raised a number, a lot of things. I've got uh, a Jewish dad. I've got a mom who was uh, Catholic, and then she got divorced wow. a bunch of times. So we were Presbyterian, Lutheran, we were Episcopalian. We were. Um, my stepfather was uh, a yogi with a deep, deep oh. practice. And uh, you know a Sanskrit name from the ashram he belonged to, and a, and so we ended. We went back and forth. So we had a lot of stuff going on, um, and uh, I it, nobody ever told me it wasn't okay to be all these things at the same time. Like I didn't. Yeah. They didn't. I didn't. I wasn't raised that way. I wasn't raised with any like religion was not a source of trauma in my life. It was not a source of exclusion. Um, and uh, it, you know neither when, when I asked my dad once. Uh, I said, I said, I was starting to learn a bit about these traditions. And I said, you know, so mom believes that Jesus is God. And he said, yeah. And I said, and you don't. He said, no. Nah. And I said, so uh, which one of you is right? And he said, well, yeah. we could both be right. Ah, love and that. I, uh, That's against and Western I, logic, totally. But it's totally. great. But it was, and he's a lawyer, right? And he thinks this way. And I, um, I thought, well, this is fascinating. I remember like putting a bookmark in there just being like, come back to this because you cannot understand this right now, but like, come back to it. And I still, um, I, I think I've, I've tried to come up with all sorts of different ways of understanding the, the way in which multiple things can be true, not in conflict with one another, but, um, and not in an incoherent way, um, but that from some perspectives, things are true. And from other perspectives, other things are true. So perfect. Yes. Um, and, you know, when I'm having a, really hard day sometimes all i want is for my catholic auntie to like pray to saint anthony or saint jude or something for me and it and, feels good you know and like when i can't make a decision i want to talk to a rabbi and when, when i'm feeling overwhelmed i need like a yogi or whatever like i the um so i i think of myself as i think um I don't certainly don't think of myself as an atheist um, or an ag agnostic because like who would spend all that time being like, oh, I don't know, is there a God, is there not a God? Like, it just seems like, um, I think I think of myself as like multiply religious as like- Yes, I, uh, eclectically. I, yeah, and like at the yeah. same time, but I think I'm indebted to a number of these traditions um, and, you know, the little bits of Buddhism that I learned in, in college yes. and in right? Um, and that I teach even, <laughs> I even teach little bits of Buddhism. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, you know, we all have to teach all this stuff. So, um, uh, and that multiplicity for me 
is um, like that feels to me consistent with a certain kind of pantheism, um, but yes. not with other other kinds of pantheism. Like if you're the kind of pantheist who says like, listen, you have to, everybody should believe in this particular scientific story about the way that the universe evolved and that's what God is. Like, I don't, I don't, uh, I want there to be room spacious. for other stories as well. Yeah. Big so spacious. I don't know if that's, is that an answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 was, that was better than any answer I could imagine. That was perfect. Yeah, and I think um, I think when you were saying what you were saying about your father and your mother and stepfather and all these various, I thought of the, it just took me, it triggered right to the the, the Gita, the Bhavad Gita, and uh, where uh, Arjuna says he, he's grappling with everything and, and Shiva or, or is it Shiva? I can't remember. Says to him, one day, if you get this, you'll be born the next life into a family of yogis. And it'll get better and better. The best, it keeps moving towards the good. And I think you've had, and, and me too, I think, uh, and hopefully everyone who's listening, has had a charm life. Like we've moved towards, you. you have the Christian, but then you have the, maybe some Kabbalah and some Jewish and then you have this and that, and it's nice to have the whole, and it keeps just sharpening and getting better and more spacious rather than narrow and, you know, more, uh, uh, simple minded or negative or something. It's nice to think that it keeps moving towards something uh, towards the good. That's what you, I think it's, I think it's what you hope. Yeah. So let me think. Uh, another question for you. So pantheism had a bad rap for a long time. I think of when what you wrote. Uh, I'm just going to go over out of my memory. I usually write things, but I'm going to go. I was ready for you a couple weeks ago. Um, <laughs> D.H. Lawrence killed me because I loved him. And I love Whitman because I'm from Long Island and Whitman walked my grounds like right there. And D.H. Lawrence talked about the oneness of everything. And then he, what did he call it? Some kind of pudding? A awful pot? pudding. An awful what? pudding. Yeah. Did we go into that at all? So rude. So rude. Really rude. Awful pudding of one identity. Yeah. And that sounded like to me when I read that in your book, ego incarnate talking. Like that was the pure, and I get it. It wants separation and it wants uh, individuality rather than a uni, a universal. It wants an individual, but man, that was rough. Yeah, I, I, I think that he really shows his cards. So he's talking about Whitman and he's thinking about Whitman's, you know, ecstatic revelry. This this mood that Whitman seemed to be able to get himself into more often than a lot of the rest yes. of us. Maybe in there all the time. Cosmic like, consciousness. Yeah, where suddenly you realize that you know the world you share with bees and steel and you know road signs um, oh. actually sort of connects all of you into one vast uh, sort of throbbing consciousness, um, and uh, and so that so Whitman will you know have these. Um, exclamations that like they're they're all, all him they're all him and he's it yes. and it, all, of it, all of it is every is all of it um and <laughs> lauren says um of this awful pudding he says oh. no i don't want all those things inside me thank you very much like he he, does, he feels violated he feels like yeah. um the the porousness that in a sense, we all know we have right our skin, <laughs> our, um, that it's it's being exploited somehow. And then suddenly, he's not D. H. Lawrence. He is also um, the Eskimo, right? He he starts yes. getting, getting racist. And that's what you pointed out so beautifully that I never noticed before. I noticed the different. I, I had no idea what, but you pointed out that that the the sexist and the and the racist parts of the whole thing, like how dare you say that I'm that 
lady that comes in the cafe and begging for money or That's I'm this brown skin. Dare you say that I'm the Eskimo or I'm a, wow. I'm a, or I'm a yeah. The minute you, it, I mean, and it was, uh, it was, I, I've actually, some of my panentheist theologian <laughs> friends um, got, uh, found themselves far more convinced um, by the the possibilities of pantheism, um, yes. when they were forced to, to read, um, just in this weird little book that I wrote, um, it's a perfect were, book. The, perfect. Like the like litany of white guys decrying pantheism by making fun of women and brown people. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's like the, you can't you can't disentangle it. I'm happy to talk about why that is, but it's yes, but, please it's phenomenologically <laughs> astonishing. If you want, if you want. Yeah, I'm happy to. You, but it, I'll just say, in case anybody gets bored, um, you can't, you really can't find a professional denunciation of pantheism um, without also finding the guy making fun of women and making fun of brown people. Um, yes. And so, wow, I think what we're dealing with is that we've got these two terms: we've got God and we've got world, right? Um, right. Our panentheist says there's God and there's world and they're interrelated, but whatever. Um, our theist, our just basic God creates the world person, has two things there. It's got God and it's got world. Um, God is eternal. God's always existed. Right? World is temporal. World has not always existed. Um, God is omnipotent. World is finite, like not omnipotent, can't, can't, has, has a limited, limited amount of power. Um, God, because we forget that it's a metaphor, is man. <laughs> yes. God is, in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible, uh, if, if particularly at the beginning, kind of vacillates between he pronouns and they pronouns for God. Sometimes God oh. seems to be plural. Um, but we sort of settle throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible um, as it goes along, and then certainly in the New Testament, on this these masculine pronouns. So God is male. Um, and the world is understood to be female with respect to, to God as male. What do I mean by that? What I mean is it's derivative, it's secondary, it's dependent on God as male. And also it's material, like it's earthbound, it's earthly. And in the history of both Western and Hebrew and um, Greek and Roman um, European metaphysics, um, men are understood to be rational, whereas women are understood to be bodily, right? It is men's job to do the thinking and the planning it is women's job to bear the babies. Um, so women get associated with matter. So in our God world dyad, God is understood to be male and the world is understood to be female. Um, God, as we know, again, because of this sort of um, forgotten metaphor, God is light. Yes. Constant illumination. I'm of, uh, I think you're alluding to that beautiful you you put it up in a lecture once the two so, was it Aristotle's view yeah Aristotle. so this is You're I mean me. yeah it's perfect it Aristotle didn't make it up he just he just reported it as a thing we all know right yes. so this was this predated him by centuries that you know what we all know is that these things are totally opposed to one another and that yeah. men are light and women are oh. dark and material and rational um so the problem that pantheism presents these like professional philo European philosophers with is that it takes these two totally different categories. God, who is immutable, eternal, light, rational, male, and world, which is yeah. finite, irrational, bodily, feminine, right. and dark, and smushes them together together by saying what you think of as god is actually the world has actually been the world all along like the world is actually the source of all things yes um, it is not and it, it's a little bizarre to be saying <laughs> that everything comes from a disembodied male god when in our experience most mammals come from very embodied women right so it's like yes, a really yes. denial of experience to just like create this other thing and say like sure on earth everything's born out of matter and female <laughs> bodies but like the first one was born out of a guy right the first yeah. one um which is of course that that's the move that genesis makes to say that right all men have come from women except the first woman except came from a, immaculate a yeah. yeah right um so that's uh so right so then so pantheism is offensive because it takes god who's supposed to be male and disembodied and light and perfect and says what god might be is like the embodied world itself, which is not, 
not perfect and which is, you know, which changes and which is feminine and which is dark and which is mysterious and which is right, which has all of these um, characteristics. And so what these European philosophers say is like, this is the product of diluted thinking that doesn't know how to keep things separate. Right. Um, and we philosophers in, you know, the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe um, recognize this from the things that they say in India, because, you know, the, the Europe is making colonial inroads, uh, like first trading inroads and then colonial inroads into India. Um, and those Hindu sages are saying things like this, like all is one and everything is. And have you seen those guys? They don't do anything. They just sort of sit around all day. And so what we have with the like the idea of pantheism is this like oriental incursion into Eastern thought. It's like uh, it's like Indianness is like creeping, winding its way. And then Hegel sees it in the so-called primitives of Africa. So like somehow like black and brown thought is um, corrupting European purity with these like dark thoughts of entanglement and oneness and things like that. Um, so yeah, so they're they're just worried. They're worried about about um, losing status, losing whiteness, losing maleness, losing all kinds of things. And I I know this sounds ridiculous. It sounds like the you know rantings of a raving of a like mad no, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's, you just see it. it. It's like it's right there. It's like yeah. D. H. Lawrence. I don't want an Eskimo inside me. I and mean, yeah, he says that it's so <laughs> clear. But what I get from you, which is so beautiful, is when I read your work. At the same time, those Hindus came in to my awareness, and it was wait, what Mary Jane's writing about is, because when they do say it, the relative is the absolute. You know, mm -hmm. the relative is the, this world, the tomato is divine. Everything is, and that's what I get from you. I don't know if I'm reading it wrong, but that the samsara is nirvana, is the deepest thing. But you have to come back to that. You can get lost in the emptiness of sitting in a cave. And then I think right. of G. K. Chesterton's genius line. I know you know that just because you go to church, uh, uh, that doesn't make you a Christian as much as standing in a car, a garage makes you a car. You, you just because you do. So you have to come back from that journey of the emptiness to the samsara is nirvana. The tomato is divine. Every and you, I. You could tell me if I'm wrong, but what I read in you is that you're bringing, you're making pantheism, I don't want to say it wrong, but sexy again, and then you're bringing it back to the, the. It's it can't be two in the end, it has to, so the, it, the, the matter has to be, become an appear, like it all is divine, you're bringing it all now, not later, here, not there. I could be wrong. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely fair. And it it's um you're right. It's often this there's often this move um that a number of the tr traditions will teach us of um making a real distinction between like the everyday and the ultimate and saying like this is just fine, the but it's not the ultimate. But ultimately you realize, but like you have to do that in order just to break your everydayness, right? You have yes. to do it in order to break your everyday habits of relating to the world. Um, that you don't you don't get it by just like shopping at Target. It doesn't yeah. like you have to first say shopping right. at Target. Right, you have to first say there's no reason ever to shop at Target. Shopping at Target <laughs> is as far as possible from the sacred, right? But yet um, there's a target there, and then I mean, well, there's a target, right? But but eventually, I mean, and this is something that Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian, will say. Oh. Like eventually, he says, a night of faith can go to an amusement park. Yes, yes. Although Eventually, the night of faith go and, and enjoys himself too. Doesn't yes. say like this is nothing. This is ridiculous. This is trivial. This is right. Um, enjoys himself and loves it and sees sees God right there. That's the best thing I ever heard. All right. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> mushroom drop. Mic drop. Mushroom drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. But I think um, you know that old. I know you know Huang Po. Huang Po uh, said first as you know as us from maybe zero maybe not zero like five to 20 or on that first there are mountains and rivers 
Yeah, the mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. And then you hit this beautiful seeing through it all to the emptiness of all things. And God isn't a man. Oh, my God. God is. Oh, shit. I got it. And you see through to this beyond words state. And then many people stop right there and they keep God as a transcending, but not a transformation. What you're talking about is trans. Sure, transcend, but then you have to transform and bring it back and you have to make the road. And then he says, so mountains are mountains, rivers are rivers. Then mountains aren't mountains, rivers aren't rivers because everything is divine. But then the greatest thing is mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers again. But you know now that it's made of... Good night. Good night. Mushroom drop. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's so beautiful, so perfect. So we grew and up that's in the your same work way. is headed towards, or you, you're going to stay on it? Because I know you wrote Astrotopia. That's a different. Thing. Yeah, right now I'm in I'm in the space world. I'm having a hard time getting out of it. Um, I because uh, it keeps changing. You know, it. Um, my 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 dead white guys from the 18th and 19th century stay put. They stay put. They like they wrote their things, and I can read them. And yes, there they yes. are. Um, the the more recent stuff, you know, I'm trying to show the ways that, I mean, I think in all the things that I've tried to write, um, I've been looking to point out the places that um, religion shows up in ways that people aren't expecting it and in places people don't expect it yes. um, and see it when, when they're, when they're doing it. <laughs> um, That's the best. And, uh, and the more I learned about um, not just, you know, NASA's plans to colonize the moon and Mars and other nations efforts, um, but also, you know, very powerful, wealthy billionaires um, selling these dreams of um, salvation in outer space. Yes. Um, the more I thought like, oh, okay, yeah, this is the place <laughs> we're going to look it's at. Good. And, and, uh, and I'm having a hard time moving on from it because it, again, it, it keeps changing um, because uh, I keep talking to some really wonderful people about their um, their aspirations, um, and because it just seems so pressing and so timely, and I um, I, I keep being uh, astonished in a bad way, right? Because astonishment can be good and bad. We know this. Yes. So I love. I learned that from you only because I never thought of it as bad, but it's strange wonder. You really <laughs> opened my eyes to. Um, I can't do the phrasing. Was it a ton? A ton? I can't say it. Uh, was it Latin? Was it? It was like a, a a different word, like a t t o n or a i. It was a separate word. And then you talked about wonder as wounding. Like I never thought of that. Like this wound, but then you played with it, and but then you brought it all back beautifully. Right. I mean, it's not, so. And and as you probably picked up that um just to do, do a little detour, the um, the, the f- place I find <laughs> astonishment sort of most adorably theorized is in Rene Descartes, where he, yes. he's talking about passion, right? He said, no, don't do yeah. it. He says it's bad. He says, you know, wonder is okay um, because wonder can lead you to knowledge. But if you get stuck in wonder, you land in astonishment. And he Your says, trouble. astonishment, he says, is an excess of wonder, which can never be anything other than bad. Isn't that lovely? Um, it's can really good. Than bad. And the reason is that it, it leaves you, I mean, again, he, it leaves you like an old woman, just being like, yes. wow, <laughs> old lady, just dumb and amazed. Um, when I say that astonishment can be both good and bad, what, what I mean is we can mean it in both good and bad ways when we say I'm yes. astonished. You can be astonished by the racism of your neighbors. And that doesn't that doesn't mean you respect them, right? right. Um, and I am in that sense astonished by um and it, it is an excess of, of wonder. Like I can't make a ton of sense of it. I keep trying, but I can't make a ton of sense of it. Of the course we seem just to be on, um, now that we've completely destroyed one planet, just to go wreck more. Like that's that's a astonishing do it again yeah that is astonishing like how who why what and and it the the inexorability of that um is 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 holding me at the moment um and you this- talked about um when you hit that point with descartes on astonishment you talked about the divinity like moving don't be too don't i think i could be wrong but uh you said something about 
don't get too stuck on astonishment. Now move towards what the the source of that astonishment. Didn't you? Oh, are we going right. the right way. That's big. So that's so that's actually like straightforward Orthodox Christian theology. That's um, Augustine and Aquinas who will say that um, the problem with like curiosity, wonder, astonishment, things like that, is that you can get stuck on the object that has prompted it rather than the source of yes. the object. That, so Augustine I mean, can I really, say my my teacher yeah. would always say as this mystical experience was being revealed to me and I was moving towards it in quiet, I would get stuck on the astonishment sometimes and say, look, it's, it's, it, 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 what his example was, was if, if you gave, if Mary Jane gives me directions to go somewhere and at the end will be astonishment. And as I move, I see the street. And when I see it, I go, Oh my God, I got Mary Jane named this street astonishment road i'm gonna get there and then i just stop the car get out and start to bow you can get stuck and my teacher said no 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 see it but keep going don't acknowledge it all right but don't stay there for 10 years with candles and get excited over them. keep moving because it's you have to keep and that's what i got from your your book like get it acknowledge yeah. it but go to the source Sure. But then I, I would want to go back to what you yes. were just talking about, about the mountain coming back, right? That the mountain yes. comes back so that like, so teachers, for example, will often, um, especially, you know, the historically great teachers, Socrates, et cetera, um, will try to say like, don't be amazed at me. Be amazed at the stuff that I'm teaching yes. you. I am just the finger pointing to the moon. I am not. Yes. That's, That's my favorite the finger in the moon. Right. Um, and St. Augustine, after his conversion, still like beat himself up because when he would see rabbits playing, he'd be like, oh my God, those rabbits are so amazing. And he got upset. He was like, damn it. I love this. The rabbit, yes. the God. God created the rabbit. Like, remember. Yeah, remember. Your amazement at the rabbits to your amazement of God. But um, I do think there's this other way. <laughs> After you've learned to move from the frolicking rabbits <laughs> to an amazement at the God who animates those rabbits, the after noumenal, that, the thing that the the thing in itself, whatever you want right? to call it, you come back to the phenomenal. Yes, the only source that we have of that abstract, it's right here, right yeah. there. So you come back to the rabbit. You come back to the street sign. You come back to the teacher and say, like, you know what? No, you were really good. <laughs> you were really great. Teacher. I love that. I love that. Yeah, the journey back. And you're all about that. And that's what makes me so excited with your... Because religion, I, I think it was Carl Jung who said, religion is like the last way, like the best way to block the true experience of yeah. what you're talking about. Organized religion, I mean, not, not that it's bad, but at some point you have to go to... Um, I'm going to bring it to your lap, to your article that uh, unknow thyself for an ending for our, for a big mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. And I love the wordplay, even yeah. though I know I I'm always chastised from our wordplay because it's distracting. There's something so beautiful about wordplay and you're a queen of wordplay. <laughs> you're really good at it really. And you don't go too far, but you, you play with the words in such a beautiful way, but uh, bringing it back to unknowing. Uh, I think you said, I don't know if it's your words, ungodding God. Can we just end on that? Yeah. Um, so the great German mystic Meister Eckhart um, is uh, known among other things for saying, uh, Therefore, I pray to God to make me free of God. Yes. Um, and what he seems to mean by that is that, look, the problem with God is, <laughs> is that insofar as God is God, God exceeds any experience we've had, any um, relationship we've had, we can like, put our finger on, any word we might use, any story we might try to tell about it. Um, so again, all we have are these, um, we have metaphors, we have allegories, we have similes, we have 
have like we, we have stories of experiences where you try yes. to say something and you kind of fall short of it um yes. these point and then don't quite encapsulate um and the problem with god as a concept god concept equals an omnipotent disembodied creator of all things who's usually gendered male right is yeah, that forget that but but that's what god is yes, as a concept yes. And that as a concept, that very thing, which is a concept, which is supposed to point you toward the God beyond that concept. Non-conceptual space. Ends up just taking all of it. And so that people actually think, now back to the place we were at the beginning of this conversation, that God is a dude in the sky, right? Um, and they forget that that was really just a way of trying to give you a sense of what it is that God's about. Um, so what Meister Eckhart says is that actually God as a concept can be the biggest obstruction to God. Yes, because you're there, and actually, an atheist is a lot closer to God yes. than a theist in a sense, because the theist thinks he understands what God means, and at least the atheist is like, I have no clue. And you're actually much closer when you think you have no clue, because what God is, if you can even use the term, is exceeds everything you know, right? So, um, we would have to, in that sense, in the in the Eckhart sense, we have to free ourselves of that stagnant concept god in order to get to god the god beyond god um alice walker non-conceptual non -conceptual, yeah. right exactly alice walker has a as a as a sort of beautiful um way of talking about this one of her characters in the color purple um who makes it really clear what the problem is with like the guy in the sky is that the guy in the sky is a slave owner that's who he is he's a that's white great. who's abusive who's a rapist who's a yeah um and she says, uh, she says, you know, the first way that I started to get free of that old white guy in the sky um, was by loving trees, right? And by oh. loving other things. And, other, and like, eventually I was able to see God and other people, but you got to start with nature in order to get back yes. to- And I love, right? and maybe I heard eventually. your tree moment. I heard about your, do you remember it? I love you. I don't know which one you're talking about, but I got a lot of tree moments. <laughs> you had a moment where I think you had to cut a tree down and oh, you yeah, just talked to it. Like it, you felt so bad, you know, inside. And you actually like just had a beautiful moment with the tree and yeah. let it know everything and let it go. And it was so yeah. beautiful. Yeah, the this was a I, I had to cut a tree down because it was about to fall on my neighbor's house. Yeah. If it had been about to fall on my house, I would have let it go. But it was gonna fall on my neighbor's That's house. That's beautiful. Oh god. So I had to take this tree <laughs> down and I and I knew it was gonna be bad, but I got home from work and the tree was just gone and I uh I could still see it. Like I could see where it had been uh, against this it was I don't you ever have that feeling you can like like a know shadow it, of the yeah. It, almost in light like a sort of light ringed edge of the where the tree That's was and I felt like, oh what have i done and because i'm ridiculous i called <laughs> a native american theologian friend of mine and i was like when am i doing to cut down a tree and she was like first of all stop being a crazy white girl like it's not that bad there are other trees second of all everybody likes tobacco so what you're going to do is you're going to buy uh, some tobacco and you're going to rub it into the stump and you're going to say to the tree not i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry like a white girl you're going to rub it into the stump and you're going to say thank you for your wood because whatever happens even if that stuff turns into mulch the wood is going to something yes um, and you're going to say thank you for your wood and then you're going to let it go and right i think what i was saying in that in that uh in that other conversation was that um what I realized was that when you relate to someone, in this case, a tree, um, you see it in a totally different, like, then you have a relationship, right? You're not, you're not making it an object either of, either just a thing to cut down or something to sort of fetishize as yeah, this you know, thing that you never should have. Um, it's a relationship. And um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a beautiful. Great thing. It's the right part. So um, to wrap it up, I don't want it to end, but can we talk about what is matter then and bring matter and God somehow? Because we always think of matter. I think Plotinus said uh, matter or the body and matter was like, he didn't like it. <laughs> I think it was more like something to push away. 
but yeah. your work seems to bring the like you said the tomato and the world back to like the appearance of matter don't don't get caught in the solidity and the denseness of it but bring it back to that is divine everything is divine and i think that's the really the right way the mountain is mountain again yeah there's a character in um giordano bruno um who was a, a great philosopher who was executed um by the church for being copernican and and also just being a jerk he was a bit of a jerk <laughs> but very smart um he's got he's just cranky and awesome and, <laughs> um, he's got this character who uh, in one of his dialogues who's an aristotelian like the kind of guy who's, who insists that mind is different from matter and that yes. just as god is separate from world right he's a straight up aristotelian and the there's a character who's basically bruno in the dialogue who goes up to the aristotelian and says you hate matter because you hate women wow and the, guy, the guy's like wow. what? You're talking 16th century. It's like 1583. Yeah. And Bruno saw it so clearly. It was like this whole philosophical separation of mind and matter is a problem of sexism. And again, I don't want to be that girl who's like bringing everything back to sexism, but other male philosophers, have, or at least one, uh -huh. of them, right? Um, that like the same metaphysical insistence on the separation of mind and matter is the one that becomes a political insistence on the subordination of some genders to other genders and some races to other races. Um, and, you know, at the, I, it just, it seems like a terrible idea to abstract yourself from matter. I mean, what else do you have, right? You're, you're yeah. there. You're Four. there right, yeah. You're right yeah. there in a political crisis, right? And you're seeing at the moment, the limits of your capacity to abstract yourself from matter, like things are going to have to get delivered to you. Yeah. And what, have to show up and food is going to have to show up and like that, that you you have physical dependencies and that's not anything wrong that's all we are that's what we are we are these interconnected dependencies on both matter and ideas and the, i i find myself most convinced here by um by spinoza um the 17th century jewish philosopher who who said look matter and mind are two different basically they're two different ways of saying the same thing I love that. Right, they're just based like from from one perspective, all that is shows up as mind, as like yes. a, like great ideas that are, and from another perspective, all that is shows up as at matter as matter. And so, depending on what kind of question you ask the universe, you either get a mind response or you get a matter response. Yes. But ultimately, he calls them attributes. They're attributes of the divine substance, which is God, which is also nature. Yes. Um, and and it's totally fine to ask matter questions and get matter answers. It's totally fine to ask mind questions and ask, but like ultimately you're asking the same bundle of things that just yes. shows. I love. It. Are Probably you a Schopenhauer. fan of uh, yeah. uh, Schopenhauer uh, when he writes? I know. Don't bring him up right now. Maybe I don't know. But on women, forget that for one second. Okay, okay. No, that's fine. He that's writes fine. that beautiful dialogue between matter and consciousness talking do you remember and and, yeah. and in the end they have to they fight a little and they debate like i'm without me there's no you without you there's no me and in the end it's that it, you have to see at least my version would be that matter is an appearance in consciousness or in god or it, yeah it's the same that's that that's the real wisdom is when it comes together which, which is what you work on and can i give you uh a tiny little astonishment between both of us then please go ahead i'm ready so so where were you born i was born in red bank new jersey red bank yeah i was born in red bank i went to school in rumson uh, wait stop right there yeah, okay i'm ready i'm ready when i was a little boy little boy not that far not that long ago um I wrote to the amazing Randy because he wrote this book called The Magic of Yuri Geller. And he was going against Yuri Geller, who was the spoon bender from Israel, who was really doing a trick. And even now, Yuri would say, I, I was doing a trick. But he said it was psychic. He said it was otherworldly. But it was a trick that we all learned in a magic shop for about $500. No way. I wrote to Randy because at the back of the book, he put a challenge out to all these psychics. If they could really do it under 
empirical, you know, observation under observation. I will give you ten thousand, and then it became five hundred thousand, then it became one million dollars. But the address was, and when I wrote to him, I said, can I come have a lesson with you? And I had no money. I was like 14, 15 years old. And I said, my parents will cook you Italian, German dinner. That's because they were good cooks. And Randy from Jersey wrote to me in Long Island, Whitman's Long Island and said, I can't come to you, but you can come to me in Red Bank, New Jersey. And he lived in Rumson. And I took the train with my brother, who was older and taller, a a mason worker, because I was a little guy. (laughs) And my older brother had to come with me. And we went to see the amazing Randy. And at Red Bank, the train station, he gave me a date. He said, come between here and here. And he started on the day after Christmas. It was December 26th until like February. And I picked December like a good now guy, I said, right, I'll, first date, I'll be there December 26th. And so it was a holiday time in Red Bank and all the people were in the train station and we pulled the train in and Randy doesn't know what I look like. I was this, I had long hair and like Bon Jovi, New Jersey. And I said, I know what Randy looks like, but how are we going to find him? And we saw a feather moving through the crowd. There was so many people, hundreds of people, but a feather like three feet tall moving over the people through the crowd. And I watched the feather and I watched, I I was transfixed. And then it was to a hat and the hat was on this bearded man and it was the amazing Randy. So there's our, there's our Carl Young, no way. That's incredible. What year was that? 1986. Great. I was just down the road. Yeah. A little baby born in Red Bank. (laughs) (laughs) That's so weird, right? I couldn't believe when you said Red Bank and Rumson. Like that place. That place. Yeah. And I was drawn to your work immediately as uh, a mystic. Uh, I didn't know you as a skeptic, uh, an atheist, but as I came to mysticism, boom, your work came right in. And I think it would be great for anyone who watches this podcast to to enjoy your strange wonder and uh, astrotopia and especially pantheologies. Thank you. And unknow thyself. <laughs> Un-God, God, so you may know God. God, God. Um, thank so, you so much. Thank you, Mary Jane. And maybe uh, if I li- if I get food in a week, maybe next year we'll we'll just pick it up on matter and we'll see where you're at. And... Yeah, happy to talk again. Um, and I, yeah. I really get food before the week is out. It's been such a dream to see you live right here, and I think the people who listen will really enjoy. And for the for the if I may do one more minute, uh, you do do yoga. I, can we just do a little practical? You And I think you are, and I think that's really important, just one minute. Um, you're you're the type of person that when you wake up, get like Kierkegaard, seek the kingdom first. So uh, align yourself first with yoga or something beautiful, a good coffee, uh, beautiful music, some yoga, some meditation, something is that is that your view on a, a good day, one good day? Yeah, I try. I try to get up before. I've got two little kids. I try to wake up before them um, and uh, and try to have a have a thoughtful cup of coffee. And uh, and re- recently, I've been trying to get out for a run. I'm trying to really yes. understand. You're doing a run. A run. And it's trying good. to understand the place around me, like the space I'm in, um, especially in, 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 before it gets too cold to do that. But um, and it's can... a little cool when you run, right? Because I, it's so funny you say that. It's not funny because it's perfectly. Thank you, Carl Young. Uh, synchronous. Uh, it's a synchronicity that uh, I just read an Ingmar Bergman article today, and I'm a big fan. And he said that he goes out for a walk early because the demons don't like the cold. And so he hits the ground running nice and early yep. and and the mind doesn't come up to use metaphor, sure. like right? And that's why sure. you 
So a run and you come back and you have a little coffee and then you see the little kids. See the little kids and then everything is everything is lovely. Right. Just give and a little now and then yoga. I know it's hard with kids, probably. Yeah. Now and then now and then yoga to remember to be grateful. Yeah. And you're not a medicine girl because I, I heard you're you're uh you've it's tried totally you're totally not against totally it, but you no. just yeah, it's just <laughs> not your thing. Not my thing. Um, I mean, co I, coffee is medicine for me. <laughs> coffee is medicine for me. But I, I affirm, I affirm any path and all paths. Yes. I'm bad at that one. Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's uh, absolutely not your thing. Not my thing. And it's if you had to thing. give one last thing to people, um, if they're struggling on the path, it would be, would it be meditation? Would it be sitting quiet? Would it be taking that walk early? Getting to the beach, getting to something beautiful. Oh, gosh, I um, I find it really helpful to stay where I am and look around at what it is that I have, and the you know think about the people in my life, and um, even even you know even call them, <laughs> but uh, and yeah. you can even make a little list of the things that you're grateful for, um, and that's not that's, that's beautiful. Not Hard to do you know it's like it can be really hard to make yourself go out for a run it can be really hard to like roll out your mat it can be really hard yes. like, even to play an app that is going to put you on yes um, there's a resistance to it but you're saying just if you can just think of what you're grateful for that you have you have a look, breath you're alive yeah. you're here yeah it's the first it's the first game i ever played with each of my kids it's a it, it, we, we call it i love and uh -huh. one of us would say i love Gabriel and the other one says that's I love great. mommy and then you go I love and you just go until you run out of yes, things that's uh, great eventually somebody falls asleep because there are too many things to say right and um and it's uh so that like attunement to the things that are around you and um and the blessings that you have I think can be really grounding um and then the rest of it it's like you're where you're where you're supposed to be you're where you're supposed to be and the stuff will come to it to you in time and some of it will go and then other things will come and that's okay but it's okay yeah and all is well yeah. Thank you, Mary. So much, Jim. So good to talk to you. I'll see you. I'll Looking see you forward to your next book. Other side of this thing. Get some food and we'll talk again. I will eat and I, I will look forward to whatever you put out next. Amazing. Thanks, Jim. See you. Bye-bye.